good-looking truck. Looks pretty much like any other new GM full-size pickup, and it is, except for one important difference. This one is powered by natural gas, the same type of gas that many people cook and heat their homes with. But before we go any further, I should note that you should review the videotape on natural gas vehicles that we forwarded to you in early March 1992. Well, this will provide you with a solid basis for this video production, and we won't have to review the basics of these systems again. Now, if you can't find that videotape, you can find the instructions for ordering a new copy in the reference manual which accompanies this release. Well, that covers the housekeeping chores. Now, in 1992, more than 2,000 of these natural gas vehicles were put on the road, and you can expect to see more of them in the future. That's because natural gas-powered vehicles are an important new development to all of us. These trucks satisfy the new federal and state requirements for alternative fuel-powered vehicles. In fact, in many states, large fleet owners are required to have a certain percentage of these alternative-powered trucks in their fleets. And these requirements make sense. You see, natural gas produces fewer emissions, particularly the toxic hydrocarbons. Natural gas delivers higher BTUs, or units of energy, than other vapor or non-liquefied gases, such as butane and propane. And it's economical, costing about 67 cents against an equivalent gallon of high-octane gasoline. And best of all, the U.S. has the largest reserves of natural gas in the world, a source of fuel for us that will go well beyond the 21st century. All of these points make natural gas make sense. Of course, natural gas-powered trucks aren't going to replace regular gasoline-powered vehicles in the near future. But you're going to see a lot of them, so we're going to show you how to service them. During this video, we're going to show you how natural gas-powered trucks differ from gasoline-powered. We'll discuss the safety procedures you need to follow when servicing these trucks. And we'll fully explain the overall operation of the system and the operation of its individual components. And finally, will point out the most common service conditions that you'll encounter and how to properly diagnose and service them. We're confident that at the end of this production, you'll feel comfortable working on these natural gas power trucks. Their fuel systems are straightforward, easy to understand and to work on. In fact, in many ways, they're easier to work on than gasoline-powered vehicles. Currently, you'll only find this natural gas system on the 5.7-liter heavy-duty gasoline engine equipped with the KL5 natural gas option package. You can expect this natural gas option to be extended to other GM engines in the future. So, let's get to it. First, the special safety considerations and procedures that you'll need to implement when you service these trucks. The first safety point deals with working near open flames. Remember, Natural gas is lighter than air, so when you vent the fuel system, the gas rises and dissipates into the surrounding atmosphere. So, no smoking around a natural gas truck when you're servicing it. That brings the second open flame consideration to mind, open flame heaters. Never vent the system near any open flame, and open flame heaters certainly fit this category. So be sure you're working well away from these heaters. We suggest that you're at least 50 feet away from any open flame when you vent the system. Also, if you have any doubt whether or not the system has a leak, park it outside until you can get to it if an open flame is present anywhere in the service facility. I've mentioned venting. Let me cover the most important points regarding venting the individual subsystems of the natural gas fuel system. During this production, Kevin Schultz will be helping us do the diagnostics and repairs. Kevin, will you point out the manual shutoff valve for us, please? First, always stop the flow of gas and vent the line if you're going to loosen or remove any component within the system. You'll stop the flow when you turn the handle of this manual shutoff valve vertically. The valve is located inside the left frame rail, right behind here. Closing the shutoff valve will stop the flow of gas from that point forward because you've essentially cut the fuel system in half. And when the key is in the off position, the in-tank electric solenoid valves will also be closed. And therefore, the only fuel that can vent into the atmosphere will be that amount held in the line between the storage tank and the manual shutoff valve or from the manual shutoff valve to the injectors. Whichever is the case, it'll be a small amount. Second. 
when venting a large amount of high pressure gas, such as the gas in the vehicle's fuel storage tanks, ground the system before you open it. The rapid flow of gas that occurs when you vent builds up static electricity that must be harmlessly drained off. So, always ground the fuel system from the over temperature, over pressure relief valve to a known good earth ground before you service the truck. Now, let me show you how to vent the system. For venting purposes, think of the system as being made up of two separate systems, the fuel delivery system and the fuel storage system. Let's discuss venting the fuel delivery system first. If you're venting at an inline component, use an open in wrench. Crack the seal and slowly turn the nut one full turn to let the fuel slowly escape. If you unscrew the nut entirely while the system still has pressure, the pressure can cause the disconnected line to flail. This can happen on both the high and low pressure sides of the system. Two important words of caution. Always wear safety goggles when you're opening the system and keep your head well away from the connection or fitting you're opening. If your face is too close, injury could result from the stream of gas under pressure or from gas-borne debris. As I stated a moment ago, if you're going to open the fuel delivery line, but not the tanks, it's okay to vent in a well-ventilated service facility, so long as the truck isn't near an open flame or someone who is smoking or welding. Now, if you're going to vent one or more of the storage tanks, locate the four-way joint on the fill side of the system. Quickly loosen the fitting of the shortest line until you hear the flow stop. This will allow a high amount of gas to close the excess flow check valves in the in-tank solenoid valve. When the flow stops, disconnect the fill side line at the in-tank solenoid valve to be replaced. Next, attach the Kentmore tool J39711 to the fill side of the in-tank solenoid. However, don't vent the tank yet. Take the truck outside of the service area and ground the system to a good earth ground. Now you can open the valve using the Kentmore tool. This tool allows for a controlled release of gas from the tank. Note, this tool can freeze with the gas flow and stop venting. If this happens, just let the tool warm back up and the flow will continue. Let me tell you about some of the general service procedures that are unique to these natural gas trucks. A clean environment is critical when servicing natural gas vehicles because of the tighter tolerances required in the components of these vapor gas systems contamination becomes a concern. So, keep your hands, tools, and general work area clean. It'll pay off later on. Next, whenever you're connecting components with pipe threads, always use an anaerobic pipe sealer with Teflon. This helps assure a good seal. And while we're speaking of the sealer, let me show you another important precautionary procedure. Always apply the pipe sealer over the first few threads of the male component. The sealer will hold any burrs or debris that may break loose while threading the components together. The sealant will seize the debris, keeping it from becoming a gas-borne contaminant downstream of the system. Note, do not use pipe tape because it's been known to have fragments break loose and get into the system. When connecting components with O-rings, always cover the rings with petroleum jelly. This prevents the rings from rolling or chafing when the parts are joined. Finally. You'll be working with a fitting that you may never have worked with before. It's a fitting common to natural gas systems. It's called a swag lock. The details of this fitting are in your reference manual. If you're careful with these fittings, you can use them again and again as you service the system. That pretty much covers the most common procedures unique to the natural gas system. Now, let's move on to the actual system itself. A general comment first. Where the natural gas system has a component, that component nearly always replaces a similar one in a gasoline system. It's all very logical and straightforward. But let me first point out the differences in natural gas systems from the gasoline systems that you're accustomed to working with. This will help you get a feel for the system. The first difference deals with the knock sensor signal. You won't see it when you're checking with your Tech One scan tool. The tool will always display a no knock signal reading. This is because the special PROM in the ECM masks the signal from the knock sensor. Because of the unusually high octane rating of the natural gas, an activated knock sensor could actually reduce performance of the engine. 
The next area in which you'll see a difference between natural gas and gasoline systems can be found in the voltage readings coming from the heated oxygen sensor. You'll find these readings will be lower than you'll find in gasoline systems. Don't be surprised with readings in the 300 to 600 millivolt range. These readings are correct with these systems. The ECM is no different from the one you'll see on a gasoline-powered GM truck, but the PROM is unique. The PROM ID number for the natural gas system is ID number 4751. You'll also see a broadcast code BALB printed on the PROM itself. Then there are the components that we covered in the April 92 natural gas vehicle videotape. The throttle body assembly, gaseous injectors, throttle body plate, stainless steel lines, inline fuel pressure regulator, the inline fuel gauge transducer, and the fuel storage tanks. These are fiberglass wrapped aluminum tanks. Now that I've pointed out the primary differences between the two fuel systems, let's break the natural gas system down into its three primary components. The fuel fill system, fuel storage system, and the fuel delivery system. We'll discuss the fuel fill system first. At the front end of the system is the vent filler valve. There are two different types that you'll encounter, the Hansen fill valve and the Shurex fill valve. These valves are equipped with excess flow valves to prevent gas from escaping. Both of them were covered in the early April 1992 reference manual, as were the fuel filler door switch, which is located behind the hinge and its electrical circuit, as well as the fuel storage system. Then there are the in-tank electric solenoid valves. These valves were not covered in the previous video and manual because their replacement was not authorized at that time. Now, sufficient return materials have been analyzed and the valves are now available for field replacement. The second stage or system is the fuel storage system. The in-tank electric solenoid valve is the heart of the fuel storage system. The natural gas comes from the supply line of the fuel fill system and enters the storage tank through the filler part of the valve. Incidentally, this valve has an excess flow valve to prevent fuel from escaping from the tank in the event of a severely leaking or broken supply line in the fuel fill system. On the other side of the in-tank solenoid valve, you'll find the feed valve. It's through this port that the natural gas flows from the tank into the fuel distribution system. This occurs when the solenoid is open. The solenoid is activated in the presence of 12 volts coming from the ignition system when it's turned to the on position. At the rear of the storage tank, you'll find the over temperature, over pressure relief valve. This safety valve will immediately relieve tank pressure under two conditions. First, if tank pressure reaches 5200 PSI. Second, if internal tank temperature reaches 291 degrees Fahrenheit. And you'll use this valve as a grounding point when you service the system. The final component of the fuel storage system is the tank itself, which was also covered in the previous video. These tanks have received DOT, AGA, and NHTSA safety certifications. And they have passed extensive GM crash tests with flying colors. The third fuel subsystem is the fuel delivery system. We covered these components in the April video on natural gas vehicles. The in-tank electric solenoid valve, the manual shutoff valve, the five amp fuse, and the inline fuel gauge transducer. An item that was not covered in the earlier video is the inline fuel filter. You'll recognize it because there was a small arrow stamped on it. If you don't find an arrow, it isn't a filter, but merely a fitting. If you find one, replace it immediately with a filter. The arrow must be pointed backward toward the fuel tanks. This is a 65 micron particulate filter that protects the system from contaminants that may be carried in the natural gas. If there is a heart of the entire natural gas fuel system, this is it, the fuel pressure regulator. The fuel enters the regulator at this point with a maximum pressure of about 3,600 PSI. And it leaves the regulator here at approximately 175 PSI at idle. 
Attached to the outboard side of the fuel pressure regulator is the low pressure shutoff solenoid valve, which is deactivated when the ignition is turned off or by the opening of the fuel filler door or by the absence of positive oil pressure. Clearly, this low pressure shutoff solenoid is a critical safety stage in the natural gas system. Also previously covered are the flexible fuel line and the throttle body assembly made up of the throttle body plate and the two injectors. That wraps up the last of the three systems that make up the natural gas system. Let me comment on two other systems that support the natural gas system. It's clear that the electrical system had to undergo minor changes to work with this natural gas system. And one other regular gasoline system also had to be modified. That is the exhaust emission system. Even though your analyzer will show similar levels of CO, HC, and other gases that you would see emitting from a gasoline engine, the types of hydrocarbons released by natural gas systems are far less harmful to the atmosphere than the hydrocarbons released by the combustion of gasoline. And since there are no evaporative emissions with natural gas, you won't find a vapor canister in this vehicle. And finally, there is the rerouted exhaust system itself. Before I move on to the diagnostic section of this presentation, let me mention some of the unique aspects of natural gas systems as they relate to operating performance and the relationship between tank filling procedures and driving range. First, unlike gasoline-fueled engines, as the fuel level approaches empty on a natural gas vehicle, the driver will notice a deterioration of full throttle performance. This will occur when the fuel pressure is 350 PSI or less. So, if the driver complains about loss of performance when the tank reads nearly empty, merely explain that this is a characteristic of the system and to avoid pushing the vehicle to its fuel limit if possible. Second, a driver will often comment about poor driving range, significantly less than 200 miles, even though they filled the tanks to full, or 3,600 PSI. This points out a situation unique to natural gas systems. As you know, there are two methods used to fill the truck's fuel tanks. Fast fill, in which the tanks are filled at a high flow rate in five to 10 minutes, and overnight fill, or filling the tanks at a lower flow rate over a period of four to five hours. If the truck's fuel tanks are filled using the fast fill method, the natural gas is forced into the tanks at a high flow rate. When this occurs, the gas is heated as it's forced through the valves. And as we all know, heated gas expands. And here's where the problem occurs. When the tank pressure hits 3,600 PSI, the tanks appear to be filled and ready to go. But what happens? As the gas inside the tanks cools or stabilizes over a period of hours, it contracts, yielding considerably less tank pressure than the original 3,600 PSI when the tank was filled, and thus providing less driving range than the 200 miles that should have been expected. The same situation occurs if the tanks are fast filled to any amount, such as 2,000 or 2,400 PSI. Whatever pressure exists at the completion of a fast fill will be reduced later when the gas cools or stabilizes. To avoid this situation, we recommend that the customer fill the tank in the evening and then top it off in the morning. This is the best way to assure that the gas has stabilized and that the tank is really filled to its fullest capacity. Let me show you the impact of this contraction of the fuel in the tank and how it affects driving range in miles. Take a moment to look at this graph. At full capacity, 3,600 PSI, Highway driving range is just shy of 200 miles. However, if the fuel contracts to a real or stabilized pressure of 3,000 PSI, you'll see driving range reduced to 150 miles. And if the cooled or stabilized pressure is only 2,000 PSI, range is further reduced to approximately 120 miles. Here's another way to look at storage tank fill pressure. If the cooled or stabilized fill pressure is 3,600 PSI, it equates to 11.2 gallons of gasoline. If the fill pressure is 3,000 PSI, the equivalent gasoline gallons are only 9.3. At 2,400 PSI fill pressure, will only yield 8.1 gallons. Therefore, 
It's very important your customer understand the relationship between driving range and tank fill pressure. And it's important that you understand this too. It may save you a lot of difficulty later on when you diagnose driving range problems. Now that you have a better grasp of the three systems that make up the natural gas system, the fuel fill system, the fuel storage system, the fuel delivery system, and their individual components, and you understand the safety precautions, it's time to discuss the diagnosis of troubled conditions and the appropriate repair procedures to follow. The most important point to remember about diagnosing troubled conditions with trucks equipped with natural gas fuel systems is that there's nothing magic here. The diagnostic approach is the same that you would follow with a gasoline-powered engine, but be sure you follow the simple safety procedures. Now, here are the tools that you'll need. Tech One scan tool, a spray bottle, a Kempmore pressure gauge J21867, or an equivalent gauge capable of reading pressures up to 250 psi or 30 to 80 kPa. And don't forget the natural gas service manual supplement. These natural gas systems are new to you, so use this manual. It'll save you a lot of time. And finally, this diagnostic chart for rough and surge idle conditions. It's in your copy of the reference manual that accompanies this video. It's a neat diagnostic tool that will help you solve two of the more common trouble conditions that you'll encounter. So let's move on and look at the most common trouble conditions and how to diagnose and correct them. They are rough idle and surging idle, gear engagement stall, poor economy, and no start conditions. And we're going to look at some root causes of problems, such as vacuum leaks, crimp map sensor feed hose, disconnected spark plug wires, intermittent spark plug short, and incorrect prom. It is absolutely essential that you recognize that the first step of any diagnostic procedure for fuel system related problems is to scan the block learn, IAC, map, and fuel pressure readings of the engine that you're working on. You'll have to use your Tech 1 to determine the status of these parameters along with the fuel pressure gauge. The acceptable range of each of these parameters at idle with a warmed up engine with no air conditioning are block learn, 115 to 150, IAC, 50 to 65, map, 34 to 38. Fuel pressure, 175 plus or minus 5 PSI. And of course, you must test drive the vehicle, particularly on drivability problems. You've got to be sure that you completely understand the condition that the driver is talking about. Another point about diagnosing drivability problems. Because of the unique nature of natural gas systems, be sure that the vehicle has at least one quarter of the tank capacity fill, as you know. The natural gas engine can experience some drivability problems at extremely low fuel levels. You don't need to confuse your diagnosis with these unique low fuel level performance characteristics. There are two additional points that you'll need to routinely check. Adequate fluid levels are important because the fuel pressure regulator can freeze up if the coolant level is too low. And be sure to always check the stored fault codes. A simple check of these codes could save you a lot of diagnostic time. First, we're going to discuss idle related problems and how you deal with them. The first condition that we'll focus on are idle surge and rough idle. These are very similar conditions that share a common diagnostic procedure. And then we'll discuss a third idle related condition, that of gear engagement stall. We've designed this diagnostic tree to help you visualize the problem conditions and the solutions for correcting them. It covers all of the possible engine and fuel distribution conditions that could be causing these two idle conditions. Block learn high, fuel pressure normal, low, or high. And block learn low, with fuel pressure normal, low, or high. As I mentioned, we've put this tree in the manual that accompanies this video by seeing how the problems relate to high and low block learn and normal, low, and high fuel pressure I think you'll be able to visualize how this diagnostic can save you a lot of time. A neat thing about this diagnostic process and chart. For example, let's say you have readings of a high block learn 
and high fuel pressure. As you track down the solution, you may get to the end of the branch, having done everything you were told to do, only to discover that upon rechecking the engine parameters, you've uncovered a new set of conditions that take you to another branch of the tree. That's okay. It was designed that way. All right, so let's get to it. We'll begin with the idle surge condition. First, check the engine parameters. Block learn should fall between 115 and 150, and the IAC should be 50 to 65. Map, 34 to 38 kPa. And then check the fuel pressure. It should be 175 plus or minus five PSI. You also should check the idle RPM at this time. The optimum idle RPM should be approximately 800. This idle may fluctuate 200 RPM either way from that number, or between 600 and 1,000 RPM. This doesn't suggest a trouble condition with natural gas-powered vehicles. Interestingly enough, if you put the engine under a small load, such as rotating the steering wheel or turning on the AC, the engine will probably load enough to settle down to a stable RPM. So again, don't be concerned about a modest surge. It isn't unusual. However, if the idle RPM fluctuates more than 200 RPM plus or minus from 800, you probably have a problem with either the fuel line, the fuel regulator, or the fuel injectors. Incidentally, this is the same diagnostic and corrective procedure for a rough idle condition. Now, back to the procedure to determine where the problem lies, with the fuel regulator, fuel lines, or injectors. To learn which, check the engine parameters. Remember, idle conditions imply fuel delivery problems, so pay particular attention to the block learn in fuel pressure readings. Remember, on the natural gas system, the optimum block learn is 115 to 150, instead of the 128 you are accustomed to with gas-powered engines. Now, check the fuel pressure. In our example, if the block learn is high and the pressure is normal, you'll see that specific condition on the diagnostic tree. It indicates to first check for leaks in the system, particularly from the fuel regulator to the injectors, so do so. Smell for natural gas and check the connections with soapy water. If there are no leaks, you'll go to the next step, replacing one or both of the injectors because they may be sticking closed. First, remove the air cleaner. Second, have another tech give you a hand. On your cue, have him turn the ignition to on. Remember, when this is done, the delivery system is activated and the in-tank solenoid will open for two seconds and then the fuel delivery system will automatically shut down. Position yourself over the injectors. Now cue the tech. When the ignition is turned on, listen for a two second long hissing sound coming from the injectors. It will sound like this. If you hear the hiss, you have discovered a leak in one or both of the injectors. Remove both injectors. You may find that one or both were cross-threaded into the injector plate or may have a damaged O-ring. If you find one or both of the injectors were cross-threaded, replace the injector plate and the injectors if the threads were damaged to be certain that you've solved the problem. Next, check the block learn. Looks good, it's in the normal range, so the high block learn condition has been corrected. Now check the fuel pressure. If the fuel injectors were the only problem, the pressure should have remained at normal. And finally, check the RPMs. We should have stabilized to 800 plus or minus 200. Incidentally, if you had not corrected all of the trouble conditions, the new readings of the engine parameters would have directed you to another branch of the diagnostic tree, eventually getting you to the right solution to an additional condition. Now, let's go back to our original example of engine surge and rough idle. But this time, you find a high block learn, low fuel pressure condition we can predictably identify a problem with the fuel pressure regulator. Remove it and replace it. Don't try to repair it. These regulators are not meant to be repaired at the dealership level. In all cases, after you have replaced the defective component, check to be sure that the engine parameters have been restored back to the normal operating range. Block learn within the 115 to 150 range fuel pressure, 175 plus or minus 5 PSI, 
an RPM surge reduced to 800 plus or minus 200. If not, there are additional problems in the fuel delivery system. Your new block learn and pressure readings will tell you which procedure to follow. Now, let's go back to our surge or rough idle condition. And this time, you discover that the block learn is high, above 150, and the fuel pressure is also high, above 180 PSI. Again, the diagnostic chart directs you to go directly to the fuel regulator and replace it. Do so, and check the new parameters of the system. As we knew it would be, the fuel pressure is now correct. And check the block learn. Should be OK. Now, let's move on to the other side of the diagnostic chart, the low block learn side. Our example still holds true. You're trying to track down an idle surge or rough idle condition. You check the engine parameters, discover the block learn is low, and the pressure is normal. You first diagnose the status of the fuel injectors. There may be a leak in or at the injectors. Follow the procedure that I showed you by having someone turn the ignition to on and listening for a two-second hiss sound. That sound indicates a leaky condition. So you'll have to change out one or both injectors. Now verify your fix by checking the fuel pressure and the engine parameters. You'll find that all of the parameters are now acceptable with block learn within the 115 to 150 range. Fuel pressure was okay to begin with. So let's move on to another variable of low block learn, that of low fuel pressure. The chart again directs us to a problem with one or both injectors. This time, one or both of them may be sticking open. To determine which one or both, you'll need to follow the same procedure that I just showed you and verify your fix. And finally, if you have low block learn and high fuel pressure condition, block learn below 115 and fuel pressure above 180 PSI, you'll replace the fuel regulator, then verify your repair. The high fuel pressure condition has been corrected with pressure now at 175 PSI. Now, check the block learn along with the other engine parameters. In all likelihood, now fall within the normal range, 115 to 150. However, if the block learn remained low, you'd go back to the diagnostic chart and continue the diagnostic procedure that matches the new condition. As you can see, the diagnostic tree made it easy to walk step by step through these two idle conditions. Should you encounter a rough idle or an idle surge condition, use this diagnostic chart. It'll save you time. Now let's go on to the last of the three idle related problems, gear engagement stall. This condition suggests that the engine isn't operating efficiently enough to handle the added load of gear engagement from neutral or park. Routinely, this is the result of an improper air-to-fuel mix. As with all drivability conditions, check all normal gasoline engine diagnostics, fluid levels, proper operation of the ignition system, and all engine parameters, block learn, IAC, MAP, and fuel pressure. With gear engagement stall, you'll probably find a low block learn, below 115, with all other parameters OK. This indicates an injector problem. So go ahead and replace one or both of them. You'll most likely find that solves the problem. Verify that you have a correct block learn reading in the 115 to 150 range, and check the vehicle's drivability. The truck shouldn't show any stall problems when engaging first or the drive gear. Now let's move on to another common complaint of the natural gas fuel system, that of poor fuel economy. Under optimum conditions, the fuel system should allow the truck to travel approximately 200 highway miles if the tanks were filled to 3,600 PSI. If the driver complains of significantly less range, first ask how the truck's being driven. If there's a lot of stop, start, and idling, that can reduce range, particularly if the air conditioning is being operated. Next, ask the driver how the fuel storage tanks are routinely filled. Remember, if the tanks aren't filled to a stabilized 3,600 PSI or are fast filled and not topped off after the fuel has cooled, it just may be that all systems are operating correctly, but that the tanks haven't been filled to their maximum capacity. Earlier in this video, 
I showed you two charts that detailed the fuel pressure range relationship. There is also a copy of these charts in the manual that accompanies this video. It shows this relationship. It may be helpful to show these graphs to your customers. Now, if you're satisfied that the tanks are being properly filled, go on. As with all diagnostic situations, check all the normal gasoline diagnostic procedures. If the problem is not found, move on to the procedures unique to natural gas trucks. If the engine parameters are all normal, Blockler is within 115 to 150, IAC between 50 and 65, MAP readings within 34 and 38, and fuel pressure is normal, 175 PSI plus or minus 5. Look for leaks in the fuel line. Check all fittings, connectors, and valves for leaks for soapy water. If a leak is occurring, it will bubble like this. A strong odor of natural gas will also indicate a leak. But if no leak is found, check the performance of each of the in-tank solenoid valves. To do so, turn the ignition to off and disconnect two of the three in-tank solenoid valves. Start the engine and run it for approximately 60 seconds on that single tank. If the vehicle runs properly, you've learned that this solenoid is also operating properly. Repeat the process on the other two solenoids. But if during this test the engine falters and stops, or doesn't start at all, you found the inoperable in-tank solenoid valve failing to deliver fuel to the engine. Don't try to repair it. It's not a serviceable part. Pull it and replace it. Let me show you how to do this. Remove the tank shield from the tank. Disconnect the wiring connector serving the faulty in-tank solenoid valve. Now you'll have to vent the tank. First, go to the four-way T connector and quickly loosen the fitting of the shortest line until the flow stops. This will allow the fuel to quickly escape, causing the excess flow valve to close, stopping the release of gas from the tank. Second, remove the supply tube serving the fill side of the valve. Attach the Kempmore tool, J39711, to the fill side valve of the solenoid. Move the truck out of doors for venting. Before venting the tank, ground the overpressure, over temperature relief valve located at the rear of the tank to a known good earth ground. And vent the tank by turning the handle of the Kentmore tool. Note, as I stated earlier, this tool may occasionally freeze up due to the rapid flow of gas through it. Don't do anything. The valve will thaw and the flow will continue until the tank is empty. After venting, take the truck back into the service area. Remove the Kentmore tool. Remove the outlet or feed line from the faulty solenoid. Remove the solenoid valve from the tank, rotating it counterclockwise. Now, take a new electric in-tank solenoid, SPO number 12540064 and grease the O-ring with petroleum jelly. Carefully insert the solenoid into the tank and tighten to 35 foot-pounds using a torque wrench. Reattach all of the supply lines. Replace the shield and verify the operation of the solenoid by putting 12 volts across it. You should hear the valve click, open and shut. Now let's move on to the next service condition that you may encounter, that of a no-start condition. In this situation, your customer will complain that the engine cranks but won't run. A common reason for this condition is a blown 5-amp inline fuse located behind the transducer. This would prevent fuel moving from the storage tanks to the engine, causing the engine to turn over but not run. Remember, this fuse is part of the fuel delivery circuit. Now to determine the cause of the blown fuse, disconnect the electrical connections on all three of the in-tank solenoids and the low-pressure solenoid valve. Next, install a known good fuse. Turn the ignition to on. If the fuse blows immediately, look for a short to ground in the circuit. Your natural gas service manual supplement will show you the routing of the circuit. If the fuse doesn't blow when you turn the key to on, plug in each of the in-tank solenoids and low-pressure solenoid one at a time. 
When the fuse blows, it indicates a short in the last solenoid you reconnected. But let's go one step further to be sure that you found the only electrical problem. Disconnect the inoperable solenoid. Replace the fuse. And continue to test the circuit to be sure there aren't any other electrical problems. Once you're certain that you have identified the failed component, replace it. Verify your fix. Put another fuse in if necessary. If it doesn't blow, you're okay. If there are no other electrical problems, verify the repair by starting the truck's engine. Now, there are two other common reasons for a no-start condition. The first one is when a fuel regulator fails because a particle of debris is lodged between the regulator's needle and the valve seat. As in this graphic, when the engine is turned off, the regulator needle should rest securely against the seat. This permits the system to hold high pressure up to 3,600 psi on the back side of the valve and 175 psi on the low side. But if a particle of debris lodges between the needle and the seat, as it closes, the regulator valve will remain partially open allowing the gas which is under high pressure to creep into the low side of the valve, raising the fuel pressure on the low pressure side of the valve above 175 psi. What happens? The low pressure fuel shutoff valve reads a greater fuel pressure than allowable, causing the solenoid to close because the added pressure exceeds the solenoid's operation range and because the fuel delivery circuit has been open, the vehicle won't start. Let me show you what to do when the fuel pressure regulator hangs up in this manner. Close the manual shutoff valve. Now, with the key off, bleed off the pressure from the high side of the regulator. Next, remove the fitting and attach the Kentmore pressure gauge, which will bleed any remaining gas from the low side. Once bled, the solenoid will allow the engine to operate. Now, start the engine. Run it for about 20 seconds, and then turn the engine off. Great, thanks, Kevin. Note the pressure reading on the pressure gauge and let it sit for three minutes. If the regulator is good, the fuel pressure will stabilize somewhere under 240 PSI. Yep, it stabilized within the acceptable range. This regulator is now okay. If the fuel pressure rises beyond 240 PSI, you know that the regulator has failed and must be replaced. Install a new filter in the new regulator if one isn't present. Remember, always replace a failed regulator. They're not meant to be repaired. Now let's go to the other common reason for a no-start condition. Either the fuel fill door is open, or the fuel door switch is inoperable. Let me show you how to diagnose the switch. Check for continuity of the switch with the door closed, or ground terminal A of the harness connector, the gray wire and see if the truck starts. If it does, the switch or ground is defective. Repair the ground or replace the switch. And verify your repair. The truck starts. You got it. Great. Thanks, Kev. Well, that pretty much covers the most common trouble conditions that you'll face and their diagnosis and solutions. Now, Let's look at the root causes to some other conditions that you're going to face with these natural gas powered trucks. We'll briefly touch on four conditions covering vacuum leaks, crimped hoses, spark plugs, and proms. First, vacuum leaks. If your customer complains of a high or fast idle, check the engine parameters. If the RPMs are high, 1100 or higher, and the IAC is well below 50, the engine probably has a vacuum leak. 
because of the diagnostic procedure is the same as you'd find with a gasoline-powered engine, refer to the Natural Gas Service Manual Supplement for the correct procedure and repair. Now, let's look at a problem of a crimped map feed hose. Your customer may complain of a rotten egg smell. If so, check your engine parameters. You'll most likely find block learn is low, less than 115. Map is more than 50 in park and more than 60 in drive. And code 33 stored when in drive. Well, let me show you how to correct this condition. First, loosen the injector plate. Disconnect the map hose and insert a punch into the map line and gently bend it up. Well, let me show you why we did this. Before the bending of this line, the close tolerance between the map line and the injector plate cramped the hose, distorting it from a circle that had 360 degree contact with the fitting to an oval shape that allowed air to enter the line. Now reattach the hose. Tighten the injector plates. And retest the engine parameters. You solve the problem if all the parameters are restored to normal ranges. Next, let's look at two problems that deal with spark plug wires. The first one is a rough idle condition, poor driving performance. This is also accompanied visually by a jerking tachometer if the truck is so equipped. And the second one is rough idle, poor performance when you brake torque at 1500 RPM. Again, the diagnosis procedure is the same that you'd use for a gasoline engine. You should check the diagnostic procedure in the Natural Gas Service Manual Supplement. And lastly, a word about the final root cause condition. Check for the correct PROM ID because a gasoline PROM will cause drivability problems. You'll suspect this if the vehicle starts only with the foot on the throttle. Your customer will also complain that the engine frequently stalls. Check the PROM ID with your Tech 1. A natural gas PROM will have PROM ID number 4751. And a gasoline PROM will have one of several different ID numbers. Of course, change out the gasoline prom if the natural gas truck ECM is so equipped. Well, that about does it. We tried to give you a thorough and comprehensive presentation on natural gas systems, the safety precautions that you should follow, no smoking around the vehicle, always work away from open flames, and it's okay to vent the gas distribution system inside the service facility but you must always vent the tanks outside. If the truck has a suspected leak, always store it outside until you're ready to work on it. And we've touched on the grounding procedures to use when venting the system. We've discussed the special service procedures to be used when working on natural gas vehicles. Always avoiding contamination of the system. Using anaerobic pipe sealer with Teflon and the use of petroleum jelly when connecting components with O-rings. We've covered the overall natural gas system, its three primary systems, the fuel fill system, the fuel storage system, and the fuel delivery system, and the system's individual components. And we talked about refueling procedures and the importance of maximize the stabilized pressure in the vehicle storage tanks. And finally, We've covered the most common trouble conditions that you will routinely encounter, even the root causes to some of these conditions. When everything is considered, the natural gas-powered vehicles are pretty logical and straightforward. But because they are new to you, be sure that you use the manuals that are available. The natural gas service manual supplement, the natural gas manual that you received in March of 92, and the manual that accompanies this video. These manuals should answer nearly every question that you may have. Again, we thank you. Remember, the better you do your job, the better we all look.